Hello, athletic training students. Welcome to Leadership and Management in Athletic Training. I am Dr. Cosby. Um, this week, we will be focusing in on the history of the NATA um, online. And then in class, we will be doing what we call is a safe space training. And believe it or not, the two um, are somewhat linked. And I'm hoping you can see that as we move through this historical online lecture. I really like this quote to know uh, where we're going. We have to know where we've been. Um, and so the way that I relate this to athletic training is to say, to know that you're in a master's level athletic training program um, and to know how we got to requiring all athletic training students graduating from athletic training programs to have a master's degree is extremely important. I think it's also important to understand who came before us, um, who paved the way, and what were the struggles to get to where we are today as healthcare practitioners. So this is going to be the history of the NATA, and I thought, oh man, this is going to be so boring. But as I started to prepare this lecture for this class, I actually, I actually learned a lot more than I thought I knew, and so I'm hoping that you take away some key moments. Additionally, you guys are probably in that phase of the program where you're like, just give me what I need to know for the exam. Um, and so this PowerPoint is built with that um, kind of concept that the NATA BOC or the Board of Certification Examination will ask you questions about the history of the NATA. So most of the content in this PowerPoint will help you study for this portion of the uh, BOC exam. So here we go. Um, the first area that we want to start with is um, anytime we look at becoming a part of an association, right, all of you will be members of the NATA. I think it's important that you have buy into the mission and vision and their commitments to you as an individual, but then also larger scale to the athletic training community in general. So the mission is, uh, is always going to be more small scale and the vision is going to be large scale. It's always going to be um, the goal of the association to reach people, not just in the state of California, but globally, right, nationally. And so the vision gets me excited um, and it's actually changed in the last three years. Athletic trainers will be globally recognized as vital practitioners. That vital word really gets me excited, right? Being a part of a live thriving community. Um, and then in addition to that, they want us to be able to not only deliver healthcare to our patients, but to be able to be a part of the advancement of healthcare in the athletic community. And so that really gets me excited because what it means is they recognize us as a part of the healthcare team. And that hasn't always happened. And we'll talk about um, kind of the inception of the NATA and then how that came about. And you'll see that we haven't always been a respected healthcare community. And so the more and more students that graduate from our program and other master's level programs, I get excited because you guys are more professionalized, you're ready to transition to practice. You understand the importance of interdisciplinary work within healthcare. And so you guys really are the group of students who will really bring this kind of vision, the NATA vision to life. On the opposite end of that, the mission, the mission is very uh, specific to athletic training in general. So when we think about the mission of the National Athletic Trainers Association, they really want us to be able to represent, engage, and, and foster in the continued growth and development of the athletic training profession. So what's that mean? It means like once you leave our program, you should still be committed to helping people understand what it is that we do. We aren't just water water boys, water girls, right? We're so much more than that to our student athletes. And so changing the way in which people um, around us in the healthcare community, in the sport, sport or athletic community actually see athletic trainers is important. And then more recently, and um, probably just as equally important, the NATA put out a position statement on um, their support of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, access commitment. So those individuals who need accommodations to be successful in the field of athletic training, right? Um, they have an actual um, position statement on this. And this is a big, huge change for the NATA because they hadn't always taken a stance on their support for di diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and what I will, will call um, belonging. So on this next slide, um, one of the things that should be near and dear into your heart as you work with athletes or you work in the sports medicine community is you'll see a lot of diverse uh, individuals. You'll see individuals that come from different cultural backgrounds. So one of the push pushes with the new standards that uh, just changed in 2020 
was really how do we um, honor, how do we respect each other's differences? And so the NATA, um, coupled with the Board of Certification Examination, actually put together a few webinar series to help us understand why this is so important within the field of athletic training. And I think this this uh, second paragraph, um, the stating the why part, athletic trainers who value diversity um, are more equipped to advocate for diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice, um, in addition to the different healthcare needs of the patients with different cultural backgrounds. And so you, you will be a big part of what it means to diversify, to create equitable conditions for males and females or students with disabilities uh, or students from different cultural backgrounds. You're kind of like the first line of defense when you think about the role of athletic trainers and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis with our student student athletes. So this has become a major part of the NATA, so much so that they actually put together a committee that is dedicated to making sure or ensuring um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice is a big component of who we are as NATA members. So this lecture really is on the historical perspective of, perspective of the NATA. Um, interestingly enough, um, one of the things that we know is that athletic training really became recognized in 1938. So in 1938, the first NATA meeting happened, right? Um, and during this NATA meeting, I believe there were about 30 to 50 people who attended. Um, but if we really think historically back to when athletic trainers kind of really made their mark on history, we kind of think back to the, the Roman gladiator days where we had uh, athletic training or sports medicine specialists helping these warriors recover from injury during battle. So that was probably, I don't know, um, well before the 1938 century for sure, the 1900 centuries for sure. Um, after this this first NATA meeting, uh, one of the, the big things that happened, uh, the Great Depression hit. And so when the Great Depression hit, we could not sustain the meetings. In other words, we couldn't financially fund the meetings. And so the NATA collapsed. And so we no longer had an associative body where athletic trainers could gather together to kind of discuss issues in athletic training. So it folded in, in 1938, shortly thereafter, the first NATA meeting. But then um, about 12 years later, we had a second NATA meeting. And, and that's probably because people were able to recover from the Great Depression. We had more financial support. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. So that second NAT meeting happened in 1950. And as I said, in 1938, we had about 30 to 50 individuals there. You can see that that number grew, right? So we had 250 individuals. And notice that I'm not saying certified athletic trainers because the reality is there were athletic trainers there, there were coaches there, there were physicians there. And that actually gets me excited because what, what that says is in 1950, not only was it athletic train trainers meeting at this National Athletic Training Association, Association meeting, but we had other individuals in healthcare, or at least in the sports medicine realm, that were coming alongside us to support us. So 1950, we had 250 uh, members, and now to date, we have about 45,000 members in the NATA. But we have to give kind of tribute um, and honor to two individuals. These individuals are Chuck and Frank Kramer. Uh, hopefully that name rings a bell. If you have an athletic training medicine kit, you know that most of the athletic training medicine kits are built by a company called Kramer. If you're using tough skin or adhesive remover, then um, you know that most often, unless you're using an off-brand, the uh, creator of those uh, supplies is, is Kramer. So essentially in the 1950, remember we're recovering from the Great Depression, Chuck and um, Frank Kramer owned Kramer Industries. And so they took most of the money that they were um, kind of, most of the money that was coming into their company, they used that to support and fund the NATA meetings. So if it weren't for Chuck and Frank, who knows whether or not we would actually have an NATA. It was through the resources that they had through Kramer they took that and used that to support the NATA. And Chuck and Frank were not athletic trainers, but they saw a um, inherent value in, in the role that athletic trainers played. And so they wanted to support that National Athletic Training Association, um, particularly the meeting and the coming together of athletic trainers um, so we can continue the profession. So you see that the NATA probably, it started in 1939 um, and it, it folded. And then in 1950, that's where we kind of start taking off. And from there, 
Um, we had an association that continues today and is thriving, obviously, with 45,000 members. One of the interesting things about the National Athletic Trainer Asso Athletic Training Association is that is the larger membership, um, and we have to have a way to manage 45,000 members, right? Um, and so what, what happened when we grew is essentially we created what are called district associations, and I'll show you a mapping of that on the next slide. But there are 11 districts, and each of those districts has a small set of states assigned to it. And so oftentimes you'll have what we call is the annual National Athletic Training Association meeting where all 45,000 members can come together to meet and learn, become evidence-based practitioners. But within we, at, on the smaller scale, right, we have these district meetings that happen each year, and those are way smaller scale. We're talking maybe four to 5,000 members coming together, right, to meet uh, with individuals within their respective states or states that are right next to them in order to join the actual NATA, you must also be a member of your respective district. And I'll show you a map and you can decide based on where you're moving, what district you might actually be in. So when we think about inflation, right, um, one of the things that we can look at is, man, in 1950, the dues were $2 per year. To be a member of the NATA, the dues were $2. Now, when we look at the dues, um, just recently, I paid for student memberships and it was $101 per athletic training student to join for the entire year. And then I just paid for my um, membership and it was $280 for the year. So we can see that um, we now no longer have to rely on the Kramer brothers to support the NATA, right? That in fact, it's our membership dues that actually support the NATA and allow it to kind of allow um, work to make us be more well-known globally and locally. So what has happened since um, the NATA has been developed and supported? In 1970, we had about uh, four um, professional programs. To, to date, uh, 2023, we have 260 professional programs. I just looked that up. And so how does this all happen exactly? Um, so we have the NATA being founded in 1950. And so there's this recognition that we have these athletic trainers who are doing things without like an actual education curriculum. And so, you know, nine or 10 years later, they say, we need to create curriculum for athletic trainers, right? And so this professional education committee in 1959 was developed and their major role, they can, this may, this committee consisted of athletic trainers, coaches, physicians, their major role was really to develop curriculum. However, the initial onset of athletic training education curriculum was not very technical. Um, it lacked AT specific courses, but the reality is it gave them something to learn. So you can think they probably took like a care and prevention course, for example, how to tape, how to brace, how to stretch, how to do the very basics. But in 1959, the way that most athletic trainers learned was hands-on, right? And what we see in 1959 is the development of a curricular pathway to PT school, right? So a lot of the curriculum was really developed to create prerequisites for entry into a PT school, right? And so we see that now taking shape in the form of undergraduate kinesiology programs, um, in particular at Point Loma, the Applied Health Science major, which prepares students to go into certain different pathways. But we see this happening in 1959. This isn't a new thing. It's just being, it hasn't been highlighted, right? In 1970, we had the first four kind of accredited programs. So these were actually programs that had AT specific curriculum. Um, two notable uh, long-standing AT programs currently would be Indiana State um, and the University of New Mexico. In 1970, this is the, the first time that the Board of Certification was created. So we actually, it was the first time that a person could sit for the certification exam and actually become a, a true certified athletic trainer. And then the other pivotal moment is this is the first time that the NATA had a president. So the first president of the NATA was Bobby Gunn. Um, as we look down this chain, we see so 1970, some big key things are happening in 1973. We, so we had four undergraduate programs, but three years later, we have the first graduate program being built. And then in 1982, this was a big hallmark moment. Um, the individuals in the NATA recognize the need for the NATA and the Board of Certification to be separate administrative offices, so to not be one office. And this is great because what this 
did this separation between the Board of Certification and, and the National Athletic Training Association, what it did is it allowed the Board of Certification to really, truly focus in on creating an exam that was challenging, creating an exam that really assessed the knowledge base of those that were going into the field of athletic training, and to not focus on the historical um, associative bodies um, content. So we have the separation of the NATA and the BOC. And then in 1990, another hallmark moment for us as a healthcare profession is the American Medical Association recognized that athletic training was actually a healthcare profession. So it took a very long time, essentially almost 40 years for us to even be recognized as a healthcare profession. Uh, so then you, with this, you had programs, more programs going through the accreditation route to get there. Last but not least, the Board of Certification, as I mentioned, um, became separate or distinct from the NATA, and its major role is to really focus in on um, knowing whether or not a candidate sitting for the Board of Certification has the minimum education um, necessary, the minimum skill set necessary to practice as an athletic trainer. The other thing that it does is it brings together all of those individuals practicing as athletic trainers or physiotherapists in some countries, right? So brings together um, an agreement and recognition between the NATA, National Athletic Training Association, Canadian Athletic Therapist Association, and the Athletic Rehab Therapy Ireland Association. So all of these bodies kind of come together in one distinct way to take one common certification examination. All right, so let's talk education because the question is, how do we get to a master's level degree? How do we get to requiring a master's level degree um, for athletic tra training? So it, it first started in, in 1994, right? If we go back to the slide here, we know that in 1990, the AMA recognized us as a healthcare profession. So what we needed to do then was really kind of hone in on the educational curriculum for athletic training education. And so uh, it was decided by the NATA that we needed an education task force, um, a group of individuals who really truly were focused in on kind of leading this educational reform where we went from having courses that were less specific to athletic training to actually preparing athletic training students with the skills they need to be um, proficient athletic trainers. And so um, in 1994, the Educational Task Force got together. They uh, created a new athletic training curriculum. Um, and then the CATI was also formed at this time. So the Commission on Accreditation of Athletic Training Education was actually formed. So not only do we now have these accredited programs, but we have a, an external body coming in to assess curriculum to ensure that uh, athletic training programs are teaching what they say they're teaching. Uh, in addition to that, we the KD also creates a list of standards to make every athletic training program uniform. In other words, those standards are standards that every program has to teach to ensure, again, uniformity in training across all programs. So we accreditation is a very stressful process. Um, that, like I said, it's where an external agency in this particular case the KD, but for PA, it would be um, the PA Review Committee. Um, they come in and they review and they assess the curriculum of an academic institution. In addition to that, the other thing that they do is they make sure that the athletic training program is treated equitably um, when compared to other healthcare programs in the college or the school that they're being housed in. So oftentimes when we go through accreditation, we get compared to PA, do we have the same budget? Are we, do we have the same spaces? And this is, this protects us, right? Because what it does is not only does it make sure that our curriculum is consistent with other athletic training programs, also ensures that athletic training um, in general is being treated equitably to the larger healthcare programs across the, the university. So in June to 2006, Katie began accrediting entry-level athletic training programs officially. And so what we saw in June 2006 is um, the, the retirement of the internship route to athletic training. And now all students were going through this accredited, accredited route, which meant we focus less on internship hours and more on the content being taught in the actual classroom. So 
Katie, um, of course, can't run by itself, so it's sponsored by other professional organizations. I think the most important organization that's sponsored by is the NATA. The two work hand in hand um, to provide educational programs during conferences. But then in addition to that, we see some really key academy or large American um, organizations coming together or to help support the accredited accreditation process for athletic trainers. So that would be the Academy of Family Physicians, Pediatrics, um, and then the Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. So we can see if we're looking at this group of individuals that come along to support Katie, we see this interdisciplinary approach to really making athletic training education very, uh, what's the right word, interdisciplinary. Uh, in terms of graduate education, uh, we know that there was a transition to requiring ath all athletic trainers to graduate from a master's level degree. So we no longer can offer athletic training at the bachelor's level. So most undergraduate programs are probably in the final phase of teaching out. I think next year will be the last year or the last individuals graduating from an undergraduate program. So when we say entry level, that would be you guys entering into a program, not having a certification in athletic training, not having any athletic training background. But we also have a very small subset of post-professional graduate degree programs. So these are programs that receive students who graduated from an undergraduate program with a bachelor's in athletic training and have, are certified. And so they go through a what we call as a one-year post-professional graduate program, which gives them the tools they need to be evidence-based practitioners. And in addition to that, they actually get to work as a certified athletic trainer, kind of uh, under the mentorship of one of the faculty in the program. These will be going away soon, um, as soon as we kind of trickle through the last subset of students who have graduated from an undergraduate program. We have residency programs, which I'm a big fan of. Um, if you want to gain more clinical skill set before actually moving into the field, or if you want to learn a new skill set. So most residency programs that are accredited through KD are required to provide the student with an internship outside of sports medicine. So oftentimes most students will work with a, a gen med practitioner, for example, or a, a sports medicine practitioner who does something outside of the realm of, of sports medicine. Um, so often this is going to be in a hospital setting and they are really awesome. I've had students who have done this in our in undergraduate curriculum who come back and they have a gen medicine background, they can um, read radiology, They so just amazing opportunity if you can afford to do it. And then last but not least, if you feel so called to go um, and get a terminal degree, there are two different types in the field of athletic training, the doctorate in athletic training, which is a clinical degree. So you'll do, I think, two long years of an internship, clinical internship, and then you'll do some clinical research, or you can do a true PhD, which is a research degree, if you wanna go into athletic training um, education. So here are the NATA districts that I referred to. Remember I said in order to be a member of the NATA, you also have to be a member of the districts, right? Um, and then as the NATA grew to 45,000 individuals, we had to kind of chunk them into districts to make sure that the members were getting what they needed, right? Um, so right now, all of us are in uh, the D District 8 is what we call it, which houses California, Hawaii, Nevada. And then it also... Um, houses Guam and American Samoa. And so we have these five different either um, states, countries, right, um, that come together once a year to discuss issues in athletic training as it relates to these kind of states, countries, right? But these are the 11 districts, um, depending on where you are wanting or planning to move. So I know maybe someone wants to move to Washington, for example, that individual is gonna be in District 10, right? And so that's going to encompass all of these individual states. And so once a year, every athletic trainer in each of these states will come together. The cool thing about district meetings is they often take place in one of these areas. So California, Hawaii, Nevada, just depends. Usually uh, at California, in California, it's going to be, it's usually right in, in Fashion Valley at the convention center, right? Hawaii is a beautiful destination to travel to. And then in Nevada, it just depends, but it's usually at the Nevada uh, convention center. So you can see how chunking and creating districts makes that 45,000 not seem so, so large. Another way to look at the districts is to look at the, the map in terms of its color code. So this is going to be uh, District 8. You can see District 8 kind of comes 
and trickles down in, into these areas. You've got um, District 7, District 5. I'll leave this up for just a second so you guys can kind of see that most of the districts include neighboring states, or they try to. The other thing they try to do is equal out the number of people in each district. So, you know, um, District 8, for example, California is very large. Nevada is decently large. So they try to even out the number of members in each of the districts. So one of the things about the NATA is understanding the, the structure, right? Um, and because no association is successful unless it has committees and unless it has a board of directors. So I'm going to start with the standing committees first. Standing committees, there are a lot, which is why I did not list them. This is on the NATA website, so you um, can absolutely go here and look at the, at the different committees. But you, these are all volunteer committees, so you can apply to be and serve on a committee if that is what you feel called to do. But there are tons of committees that help support the NATA's vision and also mission, right? Um, so we can imagine that our board of directors just wouldn't be able to do that because I will show you in just a second um, how small really our board of directors is. So our board of directors um, is going to consist of the NATA president, and then it's also going to consist of a director from each of the districts, if that makes sense. It just so happens awesomely that we have a female um, president, and we'll get into women in, in, in athletic training in just a second. I, think, I believe she is the third female president since we started in 1950. So um, Katie Deringer is our president currently. The president is the only individual that is elected by the entire NATA membership. And then um, each district will vote for who they want to represent um, and serve on the board of directors. So again, you can see each of the representatives from each of the districts um, as we move forward. And so again, the NATA can't be successful unless it has committees who do the visionary and missionary work. And then a board of directors who's really focused in on the strategic ways in which the NATA can grow, the ways in which they can um, kind of maximize the vision and mission and make sure we're fully operating and functional. All right, I said we would get to women athletic training um, because the reality is we weren't always represented in the um, NATA or in athletic training in particular. In general, um, athletic training early on um, had been a male dominated profession and we're starting to see a shift in that. But the first NATA member actually wasn't an athletic trainer. Um, it was Dottie Cohen, or as they know her, as they call her, the dot. Um, so the first female NATA member that we had was in 1966. And that's huge. That's 16 years after the second NATA meeting that it took for a female to actually join. And she, again, she was not a, a certified athletic trainer. Um, in 1972, um, or in the 1970s in general, um, what we had is the inception of Title IX which um, increased educational opportunities for, for women. And so we saw an increase in interest in athletic training from women because of Title IX. Um, so the first woman ATC that we had go through a curriculum and pass the board of certification examination was Sherry Kosick. Um, and she uh, just retired, I believe, from the field of athletic training. Um, but it as Title IX took shape and as we started to see an increase in athletic training education we had more women um, present in the nata the nata created what we call as the women in athletic training committee in 1973 and it's still standing uh currently their major role their major um, goal is to look at any issues in athletic training related to women uh, creating pathways for women in athletic training education and uh, clinically for athletic training on this side of the map, um, we have w some women who are doing just some awesome things. So uh, in 1975, we have the first woman of color um, to earn her uh, ATC uh, credential. And then we in uh, 1984, we have the first female join the NATA Board of, of Directors. And then in 2000, we have the first female uh, president in, in Julie Max. So we can see that over time, after 1966, particularly after Title IX, we start to see more women becoming active in the field of, of athletic training. I wanted to take us a little bit more current, right? Those, those were old school. Now we're, we're going more new school. In 2004, we had our first female staff athletic trainer in the NFL, um, and that was a big deal 
uh, received lots of notoriety. And then in 2012, we had Sue Falzon, who was the first uh, head female athletic trainer in Major League Baseball. She paved the way for other females um, to serve student ath- or athletes in, in baseball, really in professional sports. And then in 2015, uh, one of the cool things that we saw, and I don't know if you guys even saw this, the NFL committed, made a commitment, a public commitment to placing a female intern with every NFL team so that the teams would get exposed to females in athletic training and see that their that females could work with male sports without um, any issues. And so now we have, because of this, we now have five full-time ATCs in the NFL. So there's more work to be done for uh, females in athletic training. But interestingly enough, we started as a male-dominated um, profession. And now what we see, that 50% of the NAT members are now, um, 53% are now women. So our current president, as I mentioned, is Kathy Deringer. Um, she's the 15th president of the NATA. I imagine as the years progress, we'll have more and more uh, females in the presidential position, if that's what they so aspire to. Another, um, another, I guess, vision and mission of the NATA is really to improve diversity, equity, right, inclusivity in athletic training. So it, I would be remiss to not talk about the uh, history of minorities in athletic training. As I mentioned, I believe it was I don't want to misquote. So what was that? 1975, we have our first woman of color uh, taking the board of certification examination, right? Um, So as more and more minorities became interested in the field of athletic training, um, we created what is called the Minority Athletic Trainers Committee. um, And that actually raised a few eyebrows using the word minority. Um, And so then they switched that to the Ethnic Diversity Advisory Committee. Um, which really was commissioned to address the needs of the minority athletic trainers who just needed a voice, right? Kind of like the the Women in Athletic Training Committee. And so this committee is really dedicated to um, uh, highlighting uh, ethnic uh, individuals that are in athletic training that have uh, cultural di- different cultural backgrounds, highlighting them in different ways. They have a Facebook page as well. So it, if you're interested, become become a member. But they do a lot to really highlight the positive roles that minorities are playing in, in the field of athletic training. Um, I did a little bit of research to look at membership by ethnicity, and then um, you can look at it by district. But if you look at the bottom line here, um, we can see American Indian, Alaska Native, we have 204. Asian, we have 95. Black, African American, about 1,700, give or take. Hispanic, Latina, Latino, Latinx, um, or of Spanish origin make up probably the larger um, population in terms of ethnic diverse background. Um, and then ultim- and then we have some those that identify as being um, diverse, um, but are biracial. And so they make up about, when we look at our ethnic diverse individuals, they make up about 15% of the 45,000 individuals. So a very small percent of the NATA members and the certified athletic trainers um, are of a diverse background. So interesting to note. Ultimately, the goal of this was for you guys to see that we've come a long way, that we went from having 30 to 50 people um, at an NATA meeting to having close to 20 or 30,000 um, individuals at an annual NATA meeting. And so we've come a long way um, and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the support of the Kramers, for example, if it wasn't for the support of the dues that you guys will pay once you graduate. But I think it's important for you guys to understand, for all of us really to understand, like, this is where it started and to be thankful for 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 where it is. And I'm sure it'll continue to improve along the along the way because we have the board of advisors and we have all of these committees which are committed to supporting the mission and the vision of the NATA. So I hope this was informational. Again, please know that most of these dates that are listed are very important to helping you study for your BOC exam. Looking forward to seeing you very soon.